You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey guys, welcome back to Cards to the Moon. This is episode 35. And this week, we have another special guest interview later on in the show. His name is Scott Baldwin, aka Scotty B Cards, on Instagram and on YouTube. If you haven't checked his content out, he provides pretty in depth analysis on the card market. And you'll definitely appreciate it if you're a baseball card collector because he seems to talk about that the most. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great, great content. Hyung, you're the one who actually brought him to our attention. How did you find out about Scotty? You know what? He was one of those guys that kind of uh, just were pure hobbyists. And as mm. Instagram kind of started with a, a bunch of card guys, you kind of follow each other and then kind of see right. the content. So I've seen the evolution of him just kind of starting from nothing and then like him building what he built today, right? So Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So we'll get into the interview in a sec. But before we get into that interview, off the top... I wanted to ask you, Hyung, to share about your recent submission experience to both SGC and FCG, Forensic Card Grading. Um, I know you got some bangers back with some awesome grades, but uh, yeah, how was the service overall? Overall, the service with, with both companies were outstanding. I couldn't like say that enough. Like I was actually surprised that uh, the service and the turnaround times. SGC was about a month door to door. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And uh, FCG was actually, I think, a week door to door, which which is ridiculous. Yeah. So that's, grades that's for FCG actually popped after three days. And mm, then okay. uh, by the time they slabbed it, uh, quality check or whatever, and they stayed communicated through the whole process, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, but overall, honestly, it was, it was a great experience. I've, I've submitted multiple times to like PSA and BGS and it is not fun. Submission is not fun. I'll tell you that. Right. So the, the, like even the building the roster, like the ease of being able to just uh, build a roster. I found that like SGC was a little more difficult to, uh, to navigate through the website, but as you kind of got it, it was a lot easier to input, but I think uh, FCG, on the other hand, was more of a manual. You just type it in, and yeah, it was it was a very very easy process. It's so uh, weird to hear these quick turnaround times after dealing with PSA and BGS. Yeah, and you know what? At, at the end of the day, I think there's so much value in turnaround yeah. if 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 you're playing this game because we all seen price fluctuations and. There was there was a time when PSA had my cards and I've seen some of the cards go all the way to the moon and back down, right? So during that time, <laughs> you probably would have made more profit had you had just a quicker turnaround, you know, from a, a grading company like SGC, um, you know, and been able to, you know, sell at the peak or, you know, at, at, at the time. So I think uh, the turnarounds are overlooked and yeah, for, for sure. the for the price you're paying i paid uh i believe twenty four dollars in bulk for f c g and thirty dollars a card for s g c so at those mm. prices uh you can't go wrong because at the end of the day you need a service that one slabs and protects the card and two yep. uh people who want to know the condition of what they have right and they could make those moves accordingly where it's not gonna really rob your bank account and you could you know if you want to you know take a card let's just say with fcg and it 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 graded well where it was a true gem or it has you know even sub tens you know then you can make that decision whether you you know send to psa or bgs you know at that point right and to get a you know proper evaluation at 24 dollars, this is what the industry is kind of missing right now with with the huge gaps in in grading so i know there's a lot of bad press and bad heat with there's no other than psa and bgs but for me it's all about you know what they're providing again uh, a service that is needed in in our industry and these are the leaders that essentially uh create those solutions uh to the problems that we have yeah seriously you can't go wrong with like you said the quick turnaround times and the price point it's right. amazing and there seems to be a growing market for both SGC definitely, but for FCG as well, yeah. Absolutely, I th- I think a lot of people are um, kind of looking at FCG differently. I I know a lot they they do a lot of first chromes in baseball, 
So mm-hmm. I think uh, as a lot of people grade that because I feel like first chromes you need subgrades. That's why BGS was very popular with you know first chromes. You don't see PSA back in the past uh, grading a lot of first chromes. It's changed now, but BGS used to provide that service and SGC doesn't cut it without subgrades. Um, it, it's 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 kind of that same situation PSA it's either a 10 or it's not right so I think uh, FCG kind of fills that gap and void for that price point uh, to have subgrades so a lot of people are subbing uh, their first chrome cards right so if you think about it those are the younger players that aren't as valuable but you know like I, I showed you guys today they had a gold Wander Franco first chrome in an FCG slab right what happens yeah, when seriously. you know a uh, five figure sale in an FCG happens right that's all it takes really um, and they're putting the right cards in, in their slabs so I see uh, definitely um, uh, see growth in, in the brand and value as well. I seen a, a, a Joe Burrow Prism a PSA 9 sell for I think it was like three hundred dollars. It averaged three hundred bucks, and mm-hmm. uh, a FCG nine as well closed out on bids around three hundred as well. And this was just wow. recently. So comps are seeming to be decent because if you see their process and go through kind of uh, what they're actually about, you're gonna get a true grade, right? It's it, it, you know what I mean. And there was an example I showed you guys, which is kind of ridiculous. I didn't know if I wanted to make this public or not because. Um, it didn't make sense because I submitted an Oscar Gonzalez red shimmer mm-hmm. out of five. It's a, his first chrome. I pulled it myself and it looked very, very clean. The only question was the centering. How tolerant is that centering, right? So I sent it to PSA um, and I, re- I actually received a PSA 7. And I was very, mm. very disappointed because yeah. I, I check the card. I check every card before I submit. I know what they're looking for, and I make my proper evaluation to, to basically do that. So I thought something was funny there, and sure enough, I sent it to FCG because I thought it should grade better, and sure enough, it it uh, it was a gem mint. It was a 9.5, uh, with the only uh, downfall was a 9 centering, right? So hmm. uh, stuff like that, I think... Um, a lot more people are starting to see that there is a desire as well, like because some of the stuff doesn't make sense. And I don't, I, I don't know about you, but like the price discrepancy is is way too high for you know us relying on that PSA 10 brand so much. I know that's the way the market is, and I'm not trying to justify or change otherwise. But there yeah. is some balance in between where the value is, and I believe that's where uh, the value is going. Yeah, for sure. Um, that being said, I think I just sent to you guys the. Breaking news about PSA opening up their fifty dollar per card. Yeah, I've but, seen that. But but the turnaround times is the big question still, right? And I, I believe you have to be a, like a silver subscription member, right? Right. And then right. it's so, only a certain slot amounts, so it's like you're fighting for that position again, right? There's a limit. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. and that uh, that's the tough. Like, and you don't know the turnarounds. And I, from what I've heard, it's been great actually with PSA. People who've subbed with them, they're they're getting great turnarounds, right? So. I mean, if you get a spot, yeah, absolutely. But you know, like like the lottery that they did last last month or whatever. I think like some people got like three cards, some people got none. It's like right. you know, what if you want to set send ten? You don't have that option, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah. Just going back to your PSA seven, which is brutal. Like even now, we don't know exactly why you got a PSA seven. Like the transparency isn't there, right? Right, and that's when I was submitting in bulk. So I think they're just literally, like let's get these out the door kind of <laughs> kind of deal because we even Johnny remember uh, the like the stadium club Lu- Luis Robert who it had a like a pretty bad corner but it piece PSA 10 as well right so obviously he's not complaining and you know <laughs> right. so shouldn't anybody but Goes at the, the end way, of the right? day it's like the fact that like these prices are actually selling because a brand or a label told us that that was the grade right so it's like what if that really wasn't correct <laughs> You know, it makes you really <laughs> scratch your head. And that's why I think, you know, honest grading and transparent grading is needed, right? So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm just speaking for FCG because I know they get bad heat, but I've been a customer now and I'm very, very happy with the service. So both with SG, SGC, I think their slabs are so underrated. They're great in hand. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, overall. Nice, nice. Yeah, thanks for sharing that experience. And you know, speaking of grading and authentication, I wanted to bring up the whole Logan Paul fiasco, but um, we'll save that for another day because I feel like we could really get into <laughs> what that means for the hobby and, and uh, yeah, just it's a crazy story. 
With that, let's just get into the interview with Scotty B. Cards and see what he has to say about the hobby. All right, we're excited to have Scott Baldwin, aka Scotty B. Cards, on both Instagram and YouTube on this podcast because A, he's super knowledgeable about baseball and how it impacts baseball card prices, and B, he offers good practical advice on how to be successful in the hobby by making good practical choices. Um, and I know I'm not the only one who would agree because Scott has over 10,000 subscribers on the Scotty B Cards YouTube channel, which you should all subscribe to right now if you haven't already. We'll also include it in our show notes uh, on this uh, podcast episode. So yeah, Scott, so glad to have you on the pod for this episode. Yeah, thank you. You talked me up way too much in that introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it. I wanted to do a good job. And yeah, like we mentioned off the air, we're really big fans of your content. Just the in-depth analysis that you go into with some of the hobby topics. So really appreciative of that. But Yeah, first, of course. Yeah. Uh, first uh, question we'd like to ask all of our guests is kind of start from the beginning, so to speak, in terms of where you started with collecting sports cards. Uh, were you like us, where we all collected as kids and then we kind of stopped when we grew up a little bit and we all rushed back into it? Or have you been collecting all this time? What's your story? So that is, I think, the basic story of almost anybody our age in the hobby. But I, my very first blaster box was at eight years old. My parents on Christmas got me a 2003 Topps blaster box. So LeBron wow. James rookie year. Wow. Whoa. Unfortunately, I only hit a Carmelo rookie, but that oh, was my nice. first introduction to sports cards. Before that, I did a lot of Pokemon, was really big into Pokemon. And as mm -hmm. I got older, I enjoyed basketball. So that's what my parents got me. I collected exclusively basketball through 2010 and then i stopped collecting for probably two years maybe three but i would buy a blaster box maybe once or twice a year right so i never all the way left but i wasn't really heavily back into it until about 2015 when i started to really like i'm a rockies fan so arenado came out strong and mike trout was doing really well so I looked at all their cards and ever since then I've just been into it. But it's funny because I did not start with baseball cards at all. I did basketball hundred well, percent okay. and now I can't collect basketball. I don't know what it is. <laughs> baseball just, you know, don't ever see money ball, but baseball is just romantic. You know, you can't help but be romantic. I'm baseball. the same way, man. I'm the same way. <laughs> For sure. it's, it's always go back to baseball yeah, no matter what i have no idea yeah. what it is i know the other sports have more money in them but baseball is right. predictable for me so i can make more money consistently so i right. love it great great um can i ask what did you do before you got back into the hobby you mentioned um you, you stopped for a little while but yeah oh man high school for a few years so i graduated high school in 2013 and then i had a few years and then i was into college and graduated in 2020, but just between those few years of high school and college, didn't really do it much. Um, mm -hmm. But then I remember finding my old Pokemon cards. And again, that kind of sparked it along with the success of a couple of baseball players that really drew my interest. But right. yeah, it was stupid because th those were the years to buy cards. You know, if I'd have been in, in that era with all the vintage prices and prices of all the Panini Prison basketball, what it was, I could have made a lot more money than I have now. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think we all have similar stories where we missed a lot of opportunities in the past. I, I told my wife that I don't think time machines are real because if <laughs> they were real, all of those sports cards would be gone. You know, <laughs> so we wouldn't find those boxes or hobby shots anymore. One hundred percent. All right, um, we mentioned it off the top. Your content is great, and like I said, very practical advice and good in-depth analysis. Just wondering, what made you want to put out content? you know, about the hobby rather than just, you know, privately collecting like a lot of people do, right? Yeah. So, so I enjoy my PC a lot and, you know, my content's a lot more investment focused. And if you want to call a hobby an investment, you know, you might call it speculation instead of investment, but I don't do a lot myself, but I was talking to my coworker. He's a baseball fan. Mm -hmm. I changed jobs and was sitting next to him. And we talked about the Rockies all the time. He's also a Rockies fan. And I would just talk about cards all the time and the cool Mike Trout rookie card I bought. And he realized that I understood it a lot more than I should because I look at eBay all day. And, you know, you know how sports card addicts like ourselves are. Yeah. And so he just said that I needed to give it a shot. And he was telling me that for about six months before I finally just started to decided to actually do it in January of 2021. 
So he still edits my videos. That's how I'm able to keep releasing content consistently. Oh, awesome. And nice. so we have a deal with the monetization. And so yep. it makes sense for both of us to keep going with it. And so without him, I wouldn't, I would never have started. I would have just kept collecting the same way. Right. But I also started because there was just no baseball content. There mm. still really isn't purely baseball content out there besides a few channels. Yeah. And so that's partially why I did it as well. Cause I didn't think baseball was represented well in like sports cards at all. Mm. And I, that kind of bugged me. So I wanted to change that a little bit. No, that's yeah. cool. Definitely nice. uh, us diehard baseball card collectors are very appreciative of your content. Yeah, um, but you guys agree, right? Like if you look at sports card investor, he focuses on sure. basketball, sometimes football, but no yeah. baseball. It's very he general. Does, it's very, yeah, true. Yeah, so that's, that's my right. biggest that's my biggest beef with it at the time. So that's part of the reason I did it. So right, okay. Nice. One of the one of the for for me personally, one of the draws that I got into watching you, pretty much right from the beginning, is um, for anybody that's getting into baseball, it's probably the most intimidating in terms of collecting because it's just so confusing. I think basketball is fairly simple. It's like Panini Prism. You know what the rookie cards are. But with baseball, when you anybody that is either coming back to the hobby or getting into it right now, and you're trying to learn what the heck is Bowman first, you know what's a prospect card, what's the main rookie card? There are just so many sets to pick from. It's really intimidating. So I think one of my earliest memories of watching one of your videos is when you made those sort of like pyramid videos. We're we talking <laughs> about like the, the top ten Tatis rookie cards. Like that was so helpful um, for a lot of for a lot of us yeah. trying to learn you know, which Tatis is the best one, you know, the, the main one to collect or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's really good stuff. You're absolutely right that there's just not enough, um, especially knowledgeable people like yourself um, in, in the baseball content creation world. So yeah. Well, thank you. And, and the baseball, there's a lot of great baseball card content creators. They just focus primarily on their PC. You mm -hmm. know, I'm sure you guys see that all the time. And so I, I just wanted to take a step further. The rookie card rankings, the ones you're talking about are my favorite videos to make probably. I just wish they got more views. You know, I could make, right. I could spend three hours on them. They right. go get a couple thousand views, but then I'll make a five minute video about PSA and it'll get 30,000 views. It's just <laughs> right. funny how the YouTube algorithm carries things, but True. I want to get more back to those roots because those are right. pretty fun. Well, thank you as well. I, I appreciate that you guys watch the channel. It's, it's fun to hear that. Yeah. And uh, you know what? The reason why we wanted you, wanted you on at this time is the, of course the 2021 Bowman drafts boxes just came out and we love uh, just prospecting in general and, and uh, I know you mentioned uh, on Instagram before we went live, uh, you weren't huge into prospects, but um, just still wanted to ask you, any player in the 2021 Bowman drafts that you're excited about or any young, young rookies, that uh, young prospects that you're excited about? I have to say Benny Montgomery, just because he's a Rockies draft pick. And he right. has all the tools in the world to be good, but so did hundreds of other busts that have right. happened. So we'll see if it pans <laughs> out. But I really like Benny Montgomery. Marcelo Mayer, he has, again, all those tools as well. Um, I looked at, I think he's right out of high school, if I'm not mistaken. And if I am, right. I apologize. But um, his numbers the senior year were very impressive. So I'm interested to see how he'll fare in the minor leagues this year. But for prospects, I always struggle with them just because of their how expensive they are. You know, yeah. um, it's pretty predictable, like, path that prospects take when you buy purely prospects of when their cards are going to lose their value. And sometimes even if they're playing pretty good in the big leagues, if they make it to the big leagues, it's really hard to maintain those peaks. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I was going to recommend any prospect to look at, I don't know if Juan Franco still counts as a prospect, but if he does, I think he is awesome. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at Julio Rodriguez, and I don't know Bobby Witt as much as other people, but Julio Rodriguez is the one that I personally have put stock into because I think he could be the real deal in Seattle. Nice. Yeah, yeah. The prospect versus rookie landscape would be really confusing for anybody who's not a huge baseball fan. So, <laughs> True. all right, don't let it intimidate no. you too much. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you too. Uh, I just saw recently on your Instagram story, you did a kind of a mini rant about prospects rarely working out long term. I love that because I agree one hundred percent. And uh, you know, just uh, the lesson there is knowing when to um, sell your young guys uh, uh, versus you know stacking generational talent, like you mentioned. Um, did you want to expand on that further? I want to give you the pulpit. <laughs> oh, man. I'm sure you guys get certain ways where you're on Twitter and you argue with some people about certain things and then it just kind of, you have enough yeah. of it after a while, you know, about certain <laughs> right. players. And 
I, all you hear now is Mike Trout is overrated or he'll he's never won a ring or all these different things or he's washed up. And I think people need to make check their expectations, all these young guys. Yeah. If you look at Mike Trout, Mookie Betts, for example, Mike Trout at age 20, uh, he's 30 now, but through his age 29 season has this much war. He has 75 war. War is wins above replacement, meaning he's added 75 wins for his team in his career. And the average Hall of Famers like around 65. So to be that good, that young is still really impressive. And a player like Tatis or Soto or Bobby Wood Jr., that's a big ask of them. They have to be Mike Trout in order for their values to maintain. Because you have Mike Trout here with his Bowman chromatograph around $15,000 in 9510. And then you have Mookie Betts, who's at 50 war at age 28. Still really good, just not mm-hmm. as good as Mike Trout. His Bowman chromatograph is like $1,200 in a 9510. Right. So that's what I was just talking about. We're acting like these really good players aren't that good. And these really young guys are really good. So mm-hmm. I, just get, right. I just get annoyed with some of the outlook of some <laughs> people. But to each their own, prospecting can be very lucrative for sure. Sure, sure. And I, I think I mentioned also, like, I love your Mookie Betts takes. Like, um, um, you know, 100% on your side when it comes to Mookie and being under underrated, undervalued. Um, was there any under, other underrated players in MLB right now playing in the pros you might want to potentially invest in? Yeah, so let's talk about Mookie Betts for one second. So that Mookie Betts was MVP runner-up in 2020. He led the both league, both leagues, American National League, so the entire MLB in war. And he was a great player. And then in 2021, he has an injured season where he hurt his hip and it affected his power and his batting average the whole year, essentially. And people now say he's not even a top 20 player in baseball, right? So that's the type of thing you have to pay attention to because his prices have dropped so much. He's an excellent buy and he is smaller and who knows how well he'll age. But if he ages like normal players, he still has three or four good years left in him until around age 31 to 32. Mm -hmm. So I think he's a great buy. Another player who is under the radar that is potentially on a Hall of Fame path that it all depends on the next two years is like Jose Ramirez, for example, right? Hmm. He's a switch hitter for the Indians, the third base shortstop, second baseman all over the infield. He does not look good at baseball, but he just has all the tools to be a seven war player almost consistently, maybe six war. Let's not be too crazy per season, meaning he's a all-star to MVP level player for the last five years. Mm -hmm. So he's another one that's really undervalued. Mike Trout, I have a hard time saying is undervalued because his cards are still the most expensive in the entire sport, but they are lower, which is a good target for that reason. Uh, But who else? I like Juan Soto. Can't really recommend him to anybody right now, but those are the three that I like right now. So Jose Ramirez is like my one sleeper pick. So I wasn't just saying the best players. Right. Okay. Hmm. And you said Juan Soto, you can't really, is it because his prices are pretty high right now? Yeah. (laughs) These prices are pretty, they're really high this off season. So I think, Juan Soto is usually a slow starter. So if he has a slow start, then I think he could be the guy to pick up once the season gets going. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, and uh, just going back to your uh, IG rant, I also wanted to add, I saw, I think, in one of your YouTube videos where uh, you were just kind of answering other viewers' hot takes and and uh, the whole Anthony Volpe is better than Mike Trout. <laughs> I think uh, you sarcastically <laughs> said, uh, yeah, go invest in Volpe. But uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Well, thank you. I, I didn't know if people were going to like that or be offended by it. So I'm glad it came on in good humor. <laughs> <laughs> nice. My um, comment, for anybody who didn't see it, was someone asked, well, actually, someone, so I have a channel called Hot Takes, where I ask you to say what your hot takes are in the baseball card world. Yeah. And someone said people should be buying Mike Trout instead of Anthony Volpe. And I told them, if you're not buying Anthony Volpe, you shouldn't be in the hobby. So that's where, that's where <laughs> that came from. So. <laughs> that was funny. Um. All right, just uh, kind of switching gears a little bit. I, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but you know the big news in the hobby, especially with baseball cards because of Topps, is it because Topps is involved. Any thoughts on Topps being bought out by Fanatics? Any uh, opinion on that? Yeah. So I think it's a very good thing for baseball. Um, I, so I don't think much is going to change in the hobby for baseball collectors. Mm-hmm. But what is going to change is basketball and football collectors will now understand what sets to target in baseball. Hmm. Uh, Cause a lot of those finest tops Chrome sets will carry over. And I think some of the barriers to entry of baseball, like we already talked about is just, we don't know what to target for a lot of people who don't know how to approach it. So I think that will help baseball. 
but on top of that, I just think it's nice to know that we're going to have tops the brand for the foreseeable okay. future. That was my concern. Uh, I'm sure. Did you guys feel the same way, or is that just hundred percent? Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Really. That was my that. biggest concern. Great. Um, I ha- also have a lot of rapid fire questions, but I wanted to turn it to you guys, Johnny uh, Young. You have any question for um, Scott? No, I, yeah, I got, for, for me, for, sorry, for me, no, no, um, you go ahead. we, we uh, started talking just on Instagram, you know, just as hobbyists, right? So for me, uh, when you started, I, I've seen this whole evolution. It was same, I, I, I said the same thing with Costa, where, you know, Costa cards and he's doing big night breaks and stuff like that. It was the same thing. We're on Instagram with zero followers and basically <laughs> showing off our PC. And then we started just uh, shooting the crap about baseball cards and you know what's good value and just to see kind of that evolution of you know you kind of going and growing past 10,000 subscribers that I was watching from the sidelines this whole time and that's why I told Clark I'm like we got to get this guy on the show because he actually knows what he's talking about so not necessarily a question but that's that's how we kind of all I guess uh, I, I linked up with Scotty um, earlier just through Instagram and we just stayed in contact we talk cards all the time right so that's how it kind of all started yeah so we've been chatting for how many months we've been probably talking for almost since i completely started if not before right yeah absolutely i was that was one of our like first followers or or something like that when i started my account as well and and when we all started our journey so it's it's always fun to see where where everybody kind of takes it right and yeah no totally it's 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 interesting and like the subscriber count i i genuinely appreciate everybody who watches my channel just because i know like out of all of the different types of entertainment they could pick, it's 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 flattering to have them want to watch my stuff. And same to you guys. So thank you. Um, one question I have for you guys: We didn't. You asked me some questions. Who are you guys targeting in baseball for this year? I want to hear oh, your thoughts. Uh, that's a great question. Because <laughs> go ahead, Clark or John, if you guys want to. Because I'm just buying everything and anything. It seems like lately, or I'm just ripping anything and everything lately, <laughs> just just for personal, but. Johnny, you go first. Yeah, I, I'm in a sad situation because I got a pretty decent Luis Robert and Tatis collection. And I really want to get into Soto, but Scotty, you kind of mentioned it too, and we all realize it. Soto is just, he's flying high right now, and it's, I feel like it's a little too expensive to get into it. So I'm, I'm just, I'm sitting on the sidelines, but I, I definitely want a pretty decent Soto at some point in 2022. That's a target. Well, I think Tatis I, he right now, so I, I talked about Jose Ramirez and if you, this is the first time you've ever heard me talk, please don't go by Jose Ramirez. And, if he does bad, <laughs> then, um, he's just my one sleeper. Make sure yeah, you have right. that word in there. But Tatis is an excellent buy in comparison to his peers for his price right now. Mm, like right. you can go buy a gold refractor from Bowman's best or Sterling for, you know, 500 bucks right now. I know that's expensive for a lot of people still, but right. in comparison where Soto is, sure, I think sure. he has tons of room to move. Same yeah, with right. Luis Robert. And once he has a full year under his belt, I actually did a video kind of on him, uh, just barely. He actually is averaging around seven war per 162 games played. So once he has a full season, right. if you can maintain, Crazy. yeah, that's going to be a very good person to hold for you. So yeah. those All are good right. ones. I love it. I'm glad you mentioned the, the Sterling because... I have the the PSA 10 gold Sterling of Tatis. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. Underrated, the, man. Sterling so underrated. I have the PSA 9 over here. So oh, okay. Nice. Nice. <laughs> nice, nice. Nice. Um, yeah, for me, I'm just looking over my past most recent purchases on eBay. Um, I love Rafael Devers. He's one of those guys I just like think people are sleeping on. Um, these guys know because I always talk about Devers um, every chance I get. Uh, Bo Bichette, I just feel like he was overshadowed by Vlad last year, and I think his skill level is amazing. Um, and I, I actually bought Shohei Otani before last season, just kind of banking on, you know, th- that he would put it all together, which I was lucky that he did. And I kind of flipped that for a Vlad Guerrero uh, first Bowman auto, so that kind of worked out for me. Um, but for me this year, I feel like um, you kind of mentioned it, uh, Lewis Robert. I feel like he has that potential where. Um, if he puts it all together a full season, you're just going to see his prices pretty much skyrocket over the course of 2022. So I got his uh, um, first Bowman Chrome Auto uh, PSA 10 
uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, so just holding on to that. And like you said, Tatis, Topps Chrome Auto um, is another one. Like I agree with you 100% compared to like the other guys, even Acuna, who hasn't really gone down even with his ACL injury. I'm trying yeah, to trying to crazy. buy an Acuna, but it hasn't come down. Um, <laughs> so I won Tatis instead and just investing in, um, in him. So we'll see how that turns out. Acuna yeah. is a kind of a, a funny situation. He's actually gone up since he's been hurt. Yeah. And I think it's because they won a World Series, but, you know, he didn't play in it. So it's been interesting to see how that played out. But people are expecting him to be MVP candidate Ronald Acuna next. So we'll see if his ACL can recover. Well, if, if Acuna's prices are always bonkers. They are always bonkers in the hobby. Even when before the whole boom, everybody was after Acuna, right? Yeah. So. But I, I agree with you guys. There's a lot of guys that are undervalued. I think uh, those are the guys that you kind of go after, like Mookie Betts, like criminally, you mm-hmm. know, undervalued, criminally undervalued, some of his stuff, right? Um, and I, I do like Bo Bichette as well. Um, I think Vlad, Vladdy is a little undervalued too because for me, Vladdy is about what he's going to do because I believe in his talent that much. So it's it's not a, obviously he has to put the numbers and follow up with what he needs to do, but I'm excited for I think Vladdy because he was the number one prospect coming into it, and everybody before the hobby boom, Vladdy's prices were skyrocketing as well. And basically his first year in the big leagues in 2019, when his rookie season came out, everybody thought he was a flop, right? And like I said, like you guys mentioned earlier. 19 year what were you doing when you're 19 years old or 20 years old you know like uh give the guy a break right so it's um i think his prices took a tumble like uh, to the point where you know all the like the cunias the sotos the tatis they just went skyrocketing and then vladi kind of just leveled out because 2019 wasn't a great season and then all of a sudden he has that season and you've seen the spike but it was nowhere near where it was actually you know where it was before so for me i think vladdy's still a good buy because it's not based on what he's done it's more so of what he's gonna do and like you've just seen a small sample size of of last year so i i, I like vladdy's prices where they are i still think it's a dip yeah. totally it's it's really hard to be very good against the best right. talent in all the entire world when you're 19 years old right mm-hmm. so for him to be as good as he was at age 22 or 21 this year yeah. It's really saying something. So I think he's a great buy. I just wish he was a better defender. And re- and right. he's actually working out yeah. hard this offseason. He made comments how he wants to get in better shape. Because before, when he was a rookie, like in 2019, he wasn't lifting. Um, right. But now he is. So that might help his defense. But we can see players like, you know, let's look at more one-dimensional sluggers. Let's look at Frank Thomas hmm. or even David Lord. Ortiz. Yeah. You know, those type of players, they're still loved in the hobby because of that talent, you know. Right. That's where it gets harder with, like, a Mookie Betts. He's, in my opinion, I don't want it. That's too hot. That's too hot of a take. I don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion, Mookie Betts is a generational talent for us. Mm. And he's different because he adds runs to his team and runs win games differently than the sluggers. He adds on the base paths and on defense as well on offense. So his value isn't there yet but i think in the long run people will appreciate him but bachette reminds me a little bit about a little bit of uh mookie his the the numbers he's gonna kind of put up very similar where it's you know floating around the 300 mark 30 home runs is probably pushing it but he can do it and you know bachette drove in uh, over 100 you know runs this year and he scored a uh, scored a ton so i see uh bachette getting that kind of mookie treatment throughout his career as well hmm. kind of similar paths to kind of card prices with mookie as well I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with bachette i'm biased you know dante his father played for the rockies right, right so i've always right. i've hmm. always like kind of cheered for him to do well um but bachette i wish his defense was a little bit better you know, um, if you look at baseball savant and I'm really going deep on statistics, I'm sorry, but that's just like, it, it measures this metric called outs above average, which compares you to league average on your defense. And it puts right. you in a tier system. That's the one place where Bichette isn't great. But other than that, I think he's a great player. So if he can age better into like becoming mm-hmm. a better defender as he gets older and learns, he could be a great pickup. I agree. Mm-hmm. Nice. Scott, you make me want to buy more Mookie Betts cards. Right after this episode, I'm on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> I make myself want to buy more Mookie Betts. I make myself. <laughs> uh, 
I think I might be too close, you know? Like, when you have a crush on a girl, (laughs) she's really cute because you're, like, talking to her all the time. And then you're, like, away from her for a year, and you're like, oh, she wasn't that cute. That might be movie best for me. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great analogy. Yeah, yeah, that's That's hilarious. Johnny, you got a question, yeah? Yeah, I'll switch gears into, like, a question about content creation. Now that you're, like, a year in, you know, you can call yourself a grizzled vet. Um, do you have like one piece of advice for somebody that is starting their content creation, you know, journey or wants to start? Is, do you have any sort of like a singular piece of advice that you could offer somebody? So I have a couple. I'll, I'll just say it this way. Know what you want to do with it. What you want to do with your content. Like you don't have to know your voice right away. Mm. But if you want to have a podcast and share your thoughts with people, that's, that's, that's awesome. If you want to have daily content, that's going to have a lot of work. So just know going into it that it can be a lot of work in regards to making the editing really good, uh, making your thumbnails well enough to want to click on them and watch it to get your click through rate high enough for the algorithm to like you, mm-hmm. all these different things. But just focus on what you're good at. And that's kind of what I did. I actually, when I first started, the um, Shohei Otani and um, was it Tatis, uh, my rookie card ranking videos of them were really popular. And so I was debating doing other sports, but I realized that it wasn't a smart move because the reason why people like what I was doing is because I knew what I was talking about at least mm. a little bit. So it's one of those things, do what you know, because if you're able to talk about what you know, other people who are similar to you are going to be attracted to your content. And that's right. how you're going to grow. Great advice. Nice. If you fake it, people will know. If you try to be the same as somebody else, People will know. Find your niche, and that's that's going to be really helpful. So, great advice. Great advice. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Scotty. Um, I want to kind of uh, wrap up this interview with a few rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Um, great, let's do it. Just about the hobby in general. But uh, number one is Wander Franco's Bowman's best card, his flagship rookie card. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I, I know the reason I say that. So. For you guys that don't know, Beckett, for some reason, thinks that's his rookie card because they share the checklist with veterans. Right. That is the silliest definition of a rookie card. We have <laughs> literal rookie logos in that set. And this yeah. is his third prospect Bowman's best card. So no, I don't think so. <laughs> but so I see why people might think it. Got it. <laughs> so I assume that you're, you're on the top well, series one, I guess, 2022 will be his flagship rookie. Yeah. It's going to be printed to the moon, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I know you've, uh, we talked about how you take hobby hot takes from uh, your subscribers, uh, your viewers, and you kind of uh, react to it. Do you have a hobby hot take yourself for this upcoming season? Oh, man. Let's define a hot take. So how hot do you want it? As boiling. Hot want. Boiling hot. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you really, truly believe. What, what, that would be a mildly hot take, so that way people who are listening will actually not hate me. I'm <laughs> going to say Mike Trout's going to put up an eight-war season, and Mookie Betts will have a six-war season, if they can stay healthy, of course. But nice. that's my hot take. If they're healthy, they're going to have top five MVP seasons each. Wow. Nice. Okay. Nice. Right. On the same topic. Oh, let me get one more hot than that. That's, that's, I've already started, shared that opinion like five times in this video. Um, let me think. I think that Aaron Judge is going to be a top nah, – he's a top five candidate this year. Get back to me. We'll come back to that okay. <laughs> I like Aaron Judge, though. I like where you're going there. <laughs> all right, we'll come back to you. Whenever you think of one, just jump in. Um, all right, what's the favorite card you personally own right now? Oh, man. I can show you the most recent card I got in. If you want okay. to grab it real quick. Sure. And I'll, I'll tell everybody else who's listening on the podcast so that way they don't feel left out. <laughs> So I actually was just sorting everything just barely. Mm-hmm. And I have, I had a really cool um, Juan Soto atomic autograph from Bowman's best. I oh, just nice. traded wow. for his Bowman's best first autograph. So I know I traded a gorgeous card for not so pretty card, but I just got that card in, but I also got this card in, which I really like. This is Mike Trout. So you guys might have already seen oh, it. Oh, yeah. Bowman no. Sterling. Oh, nice. Yeah. Underrated. Sterling 25. So oh, 25. It is an 8-5, but to get a Mike Trout rookie that low numbered is something right. I didn't think I was going to do yet. So this is my newest one. And, of course, the newest one you buy is the one you like. So 
you see yeah. something else you want on the internet so you buy that one so that's a sweet card yeah um how about what's your grail card something you don't have yet but so i've always wanted to get a mookie betts gold bowman chrome autograph and i actually had the opportunity to buy a mookie betts red bowman chrome autograph number to five wow. for twenty five thousand dollars and at the time I didn't have the a powerful enough a collection to sell everything and buy it, but now I would get it in a heartbeat because that would have been mm. a great card. I think yeah. it's like a five hundred thousand dollar card. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I I downgraded from my grail being a red to a gold because I might be able to afford that one. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> that, that would have been a sweet card, and that that doesn't come obviously out number to five. It doesn't come out ever, right? right. I know I know a guy who owns it, but I know what he's asking for, it, and I think it's fair, but it's definitely worth more than my house so probably not <laughs> cool all right then uh we kind of uh, touched upon this already but we'd love to ask um our guests our american friends um you know with vlad guerrero and boba Shett playing for the jays and we're rooting hard for them we sometimes need uh, that kind of check are we just being homers or do you think they're legit studs i think they're both very good i think vlad's better than bichette and i think bichette's great but i think vlad if like, you know, he played in Dunedin and he played in Buffalo and that really helped his numbers, but I still think he unlocked something last year. So no, I don't think your homers one bit. I just hope <laughs> George Springer turns out to be a decent contract for you. Cause that's, what's going to tear you down. If it doesn't work right. out, yeah. Mm-hmm. Take a lot of money for Mr. Springer and he might not play at all. So for sure. That's right. So we'll, I don't know uh, if you guys agree with that or not. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. Agreed. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're still looking forward to the season. We got a young core. Well, how do you guys feel about Austin Martin being traded for who was it, Jose Barrios? You know what? I- I'm I'm okay with that. Hundred yeah. percent. I'm mm-hmm. okay. I wasn't high on Austin Martin to begin with, to be honest. What worries about me with him is 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 the size, to be honest. Um, and it was he was at at Vandy and he he performed well in in the college setting, but. Pro ball is different, and you kind of see it in the minors. Uh, I mean, this year is going to be obviously a big year, but he came in with a lot of hype, and um, and he honestly put very very sub average numbers, and that's what really worries me with with guys of I guess his size is the strength is the strength there to to endure to carry. That's the same kind of question with like Mookie Betts, Bo Bichette. Are are their bodies going to be able to kind of sustain? And for me. I'm I'm glad we got rid of him, to be honest. I thought it was a good trade. <laughs> no, I think it was good for you, too, in the long run. It's it's one of those things where like, you traded your top prospect, but right. he didn't yeah. have – he was in double-A and had a sub-800 OPS with only five home runs. I I think it was a good move. We'll just see if Barrios can be Barrios in it. It's mm, great. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. All no, I'm know. excited for you guys. I want you to beat the Rays in the Yankees. That'd be so <laughs> cool. It sucks in the AL East, man. I'm telling you, it's tough. We grew up it's in the You guys league. might have a second team with the Rays possibly splitting half the season in Canada, apparently. So in Montreal, right? In Montreal. Yeah, <laughs> so that'll be interesting if it happens. But no, I hope yeah. the Blue Jays can be good. Thank you. Appreciate uh, the love for the <laughs> Jays. I, I wish you the same for the Rockies, but I think they're in full rebuild at this point, right? I, I hope the Rockies lose. <laughs> Hundred games next traffic. year, so they can have a decent <laughs> prospect. But think about their division with the Giants and the Dodgers and the Padres. They have no chance. But you're in a tough division you know. too, for sure. Yeah. So sure. if they lose a lot of good, better picks for the next year, I'll be okay. We already lost Story, so we're gonna suck. But I'll still watch because <laughs> yeah. I, I like they're, torture they're your team. Myself. They're your team. Yep. It's baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, uh, really, really appreciate your time. Um, again, appreciate all the content you put out on your YouTube channel. Uh, so insightful, in depth, and for us, uh, hardcore baseball collectors, uh, really appreciate um, all that you put out. And uh, again, thanks for joining us. So I appreciate your time. Yeah, of course. And thanks for having me on. It's great to be on the podcast. And thanks for all you guys do for the hobby. And if you ever need another guest talk baseball, feel free to let me know. Yeah, we might Appreciate call you it. on opening day. We'll see. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. If there's an opening day. If there is <laughs> an opening day. <laughs> there will be. There will be. Right, I like dog guys. system. Thanks, fellas. <laughs> All right. All right, that was another great interview for our podcast. Really appreciate having Scott on the, this episode. Um, just his baseball knowledge. Like You could tell that he's deep into it and he knows what he's talking about, right? For sure, absolutely, and I think that's what's missing is 
the the very very detailed baseball guy yeah right or because a lot of people want you know like talk about ssps and sps and you know they want to talk about paper parallels and all these you know uh baseball terms Mm -hmm. and and stuff like that that we're missing kind of in the hobby right because we get such a generic um you know, hobby uh, viewpoint from everybody, and it's always very general because they have right. to cover a wide a range of people, right? So mm-hmm. it's good having those kind of like uh, pocket guys that that stick with what they're good at, right? So absolutely, right. and especially this year coming, I think in 2020, 2021, it was just you know the collecting world was just all about hype, right? Like you you go for Soto, Tatis, Wander, Luis Robert, and that was it. And I think now that the, you know, the, the, the hobby collectors, investors, whatever you want to call it, everybody's a lot more wiser. We're not, you know, people aren't jumping on the hype anymore. I think the, the, the investment, you know, the, the, the plane or traje- trajectory is going to be a lot slower. So it's, it's channels like Scotty's channel that are going to be really, really valuable for you in the future, in, especially this year, yeah. where you really need to make critical decisions or you need need to find that sort of like gem out of a bunch of information mm-hmm. um to make to to get you to make it like a, a more educated decision decision making right instead of just like making decisions based on hype so you know for for those that are listening like yeah i think S- scotty's channel is is super valuable um for this upcoming year where you, where it's going to be a lot tougher to 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 make money or to to grow your grow your investment or grow your collection so yeah. yeah like guys like scotty his his um content like to find those sleepers you know like everyone's going to talk about the main guys like you mentioned but his channel is right. invaluable for that you know finding those guys right. that can really pop and then it won't even cost you relatively that much to invest in and then you know you could also uh, grow your collection that way you, if mm-hmm. you make a nice flip uh, based on good information yeah, it just will help you in the long run as well. So mm-hmm. definitely appreciate Scott and um, him coming on just to talk about baseball and the hobby in general. And uh, yeah, like we said, hopefully we'll have him back on sooner than later. Um, hopefully baseball will start in April, May. Uh, we don't know how this lockout's going to end up, but I, I, I'm optimistic. I feel like we're going to start on, on schedule. So uh, hopefully we'll have him back um, during that time for another episode. All right, so um, let's end off this episode with our regular weekly segment called Pick One. And this week, it's our regular edition, so we're just going to choose two cards or two sets, uh, pit them against one another, and then we'll debate which one we'd rather invest in. Okay, so Hyung, you want to start off? Absolutely. We'll go uh, today because we talked about a little bit about Mookie Betts and undervalued, and I agree. His his Bowman Chrome is cheaper than, let's just say, uh a rookie's like you know Tatis yeah right or someone who's you know second third year so we'll go with the 2014 Bowman Chrome first Chrome Mookie Betts BGS 9.5 they sell for about a thousand to 1300 right now uh, versus a 2016 Bo Bichette Bowman Chrome first BGS 9.5 which t- sells at about 500 to 700 so you got more value is is what I was going for. So if you're buying a first Chrome, who would it be, Mookie or or Bo Bichette on, on the BGS based on their prices? And those are both autos. They're both autos. Sorry, base autos. They're first okay. Chrome base autos. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's funny? Uh, I was gonna take the Homer pick because it felt pretty easy, but after talking with Scotty. I'm gonna change it. <laughs> uh, you know, he's he's a huge believer in Mookie Betts, and you know, Clarky and Kyung, you guys are too. Um, but I've I've been influenced the other way. I'm gonna go with the I'm gonna go with the Mookie, and uh, kind of going back to what I just just said about Scotty's channel. I think in 2022, it's just gonna be so much more critical this year when you're spending your money and you're making investments. Uh, to be a lot smarter instead of just sort of chasing what's sexy or what's the best out there, like using statistics and all of that to your knowledge. And I think once people kind of catch on to how really, you know, how amazing Mookie really is, um, everybody's been kind of saying he's way undervalued for the trajectory of where he's he's about to go, right? Hall of Fame and you could be one of the best baseball players of all time. So given that his, you know, one of his 
Grail cards auto base is only around a thousand bucks. I can't say that that's not a steal. Like that has to be. As much as I wanted to pick Bobichet, a thousand dollars for somebody who's kind of almost on that Mike Trout level, that doesn't make any sense to me. So uh, I'm gonna pick Mookie Betts. I feel like you, Clark. I feel like this was for me because um, <laughs> <laughs> I love Mookie. I love Bobichet. It's on, it's on record, <laughs> and um, you know I'm gonna take <clears throat> I'm gonna take personal bias out of this because you guys also know my Mookie Betts first Bowman Chrome Auto story where I sold it for a great sixty dollars back in the day. <laughs> oh, <man>. oh. <laughs> so it's one of those things where you're like I can never buy that card again, but I'm gonna pretend that never happened to, for this for this scenario. Um, and I also have a Bowman Chrome uh, refractor of Boba Shet. PGS95. So I already have his card, but I'm going to nice. pretend I don't have that. So all things considered <laughs> equal, um, I'm going to go with Mookie Betts too. Like I'm such a big believer. That's why I kind of wanted Scott to come on the show too. I just want him to reaffirm my beliefs in Mookie uh, even <laughs> even more than more than I had um, before the show. And um, yeah, like I love players that have done it before, like had an amazing season, which Mookie has done. Um, I love players that still have the talent but they didn't play to their potential because of injury and i think if they um stay healthy um, and i believe in their talent then it's a really and the prices have gone down because of their injury um then it's an easy investment for me in mookie and that was my thought process for buying shohei last year you know like he's had a great season before got injured didn't live up to the potential everyone was off his bandwagon prices dropped and that's when you just go in to get the price that you know, at the price level where it's selling now. And I feel like Mookie kind of follows that trend perfectly. Um, so I love both players, but I think Mookie has the bigger upside. So I'm going with Mookie as well. Very nice. Yeah, I, I think both of them are, are great buys um, right now. And that's why I put it up. It's the, would you rather spend a little more money to get the better kind of like overall investment? Or would you uh, want to, you know, uh, invest a little more for potentially, you know, uh, a bigger, I guess, uh, multiplier because you're, you're, you're buying so low, right? So, but I agree. I think Mookie Betts is, is a serious buy right now based on what he's accomplished in his career. I even went and got that Topps Chrome Auto. I, I'm, I'm grateful that I did. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's a Pop 1 Topps Chrome Mookie Betts Auto. Uh, it's an IP Auto, but... Um, and I, I think that was severely underpriced based on, you know, his top scrum price now pushing over 900 now right so there's certain cards with Mookie that I think like his tops chrome it, it's it's pretty expensive but then his tops update is is dirt cheap still it's only a couple hundred bucks right so I think there's huge opportunity there um and I think overall Mookie bets is a is a is a amazing buy at a thousand bucks you know just under you know 1300 bucks at, at at peak I guess uh for his BGS 95 and I think uh like like you guys all said that it's gonna be a sweep you know it's it's <laughs> it's too good of a deal to kind of pass by so nice. I guess uh, we're all bidding on Mookie autos tonight <laughs> <laughs> let's just call this uh show episode the Mookie bets episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right, good one. And I, and I have the Tops update red hot foil too, so I'm I'm cheering hard. For nice, Mookie. nice. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. All right. All right, I'm going to stick with the Scotty B baseball theme today. Um, my 1v1 is going to be what is the more lucrative flipping strategy? Bowman first prospecting before they become pros versus pro prospects in years one to three, the hype years. So we're talking... Think of it as sort of Volpe, Mayer versus Wander, Bobby Witt. Which of the two investment strategies is the more lucrative? Go for it, Clark. It doesn't hurt to answer because I think the more lucrative is buying them as a prospect. You just got a hit. It's like a lotto ticket, right? But I feel like if you're playing the odds, I like playing the odds for when they actually play in the in the big leagues and you know they have a good half season at least um under them and i'll pay a bit of a premium um to buy their card and you know being more confident in their ability to play in the pros um so i'm going to go with your second choice 
But I think, you know, if you if you hit everything right, like if you win the lotto, sure, that's more lucrative, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but what's more realistic? I think, yeah, just seeing them in their first year or two. So that's what I do. Interesting. I'm uh, I'm actually going the other way because, you know, I, the, it's the volatility. We, oh, we it's, know, we know. It's the volatility. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, my justification, I agree. Once those prospects all don't pan out, you pretty much lose out because the values just tank, right? And the odds of every kid becoming a superstar is, or the next Acuna or Tatis is very, very rare. You're talking, you know, very, very rare, probably 1% rare. And uh, for me, it's all about leading up to it, uh, following the minor league players, their progression, their prospects. And for me, if a team is investing millions of dollars in a prospect and they see the talent and they see the development of a kid going through that, I like that process because there's fluctuation in price so much in that game. And like everybody's after, we talked about when Scotty was on the show, a red Mookie Betts, you know, going for 20000 at the time or 25000 that he missed out on. It's over a half a million dollar card now, right? How how do you think, why do you think people get those cards, um, you know, for $5,000 when Mookie Betts was, you know, over that, that was overpaying at the time, right? So for me, it's impossible to get those prospect cards that everybody's after that have potential to essentially hit the lottery, right? But for me, it's all about playing the game within that time frame. I'm not this is not a long term strategy at all. You gotta you gotta just do it for the profit and know when to kinda, you know, buy and sell and, you know, get in and get out. And there's some some cards that you probably come across uh that are, you know, colors of huge prospects that you're probably not gonna sell. Uh anyways, you're probably gonna hold hoping that it is the fifty hundred, five hundred thousand dollar card one day, right? Like the Bobby Witt Reds or the Orange or the Wander Super Fractor that people are paying enormous amounts. The logic is always, oh, he hasn't accomplished anything. Yeah, I know. Like it's the expectation and anticipation. That's the whole part of the game because if he does hit or he pans out, those prices go bonkers and people see that as opportunity, right? So I, I don't think you could use logic because everybody's logic is so different, right? Right. So for me, it's uh, prospecting is, is, is a great opportunity for you to make that money. And, it, and it's saying that you could lose money and they might not pan out, but at the end of the day, if you hit a good color, I think that's why it's, it's great to rip like, first chromes uh, or products. So Bowman draft, Bowman chromes, your Bowman releases because the ROI potentially like Volpe two years ago was literally pennies, hundred, hundreds of dollars. And people were buying refractor autos for 250 bucks. They knew Volpe was going to be a stud. They knew Bobby Witt was going to be a stud. And at the time, yeah, he didn't play a minor league season. Who's going to pay 600 bucks for a refractor auto. It's the same story, right? So for me, it's, um, I like the prospecting game. I think there's so much opportunity there. And what scares me about the rookie game is we see that dip after that rookie season. You know, um, they have a couple good years. People don't want their cards. They're forgotten. And then all of a sudden they have that goat career path. That's when cards start raising again, right? So for me, long term, yeah, you might play the rookie game. But for, for tendies or profits, I'm going prospects. I know I was rambling at, uh, on about that. But, yeah, I'm going prospects. <laughs> I like it. So I, I'm in agreement with both you guys. I What I would personally actually do is what Clark chose in that playing the pro prospect game. I think that's, I'm not as into the risk game or like volatility as Hyung is. So that's probably, that's what I would actually do. But then I'm going to pick the Bowman first prospecting. That's my pick as the more lucrative lucrative one. And I don't, I'm not a big prospector, but I'm learning. And Hyung's a big prospector, so I've been kind of learning from him on how this all works. And I think for anybody like myself who is getting or like finding out about it, I think early on when you you think about prospecting, it really confuses you, right? Like Bobby, uh, I mean, um, Scotty released a couple of videos where he's like, it doesn't make sense. Like, how is it that a Trout rookie is three grand and a Volpe rookie is three grand? Like, how does that make any sense? Right, so I think for... 
like a an early um, collector, it doesn't make any sense. And you and those people will actually criticize those that are collecting in the prospecting world. But then when Hyung kind of dove deeper into it, it actually makes a lot of sense. I think if you're in this game before the prospect turns into a pro, because if you look at prices of these prospects, when they make it, you know, like you're looking at Jared Kalenic and all those guys who are so hyped, and the moment they get into the pros and their first year they bat a buck twenty, like the price just goes woo, like all the way down. So I think your best bet is literally playing just the prospecting game, like playing that hype before they become a pro, and then you you sell off. And I, of course, you're kind of left with the scary thought of you're the one guy who sold the Soto Red before he became a pro. <laughs> like obviously, there's that world of it, but I I think. Like, Hyung, the, the thing that really stuck with me the most, actually, of everything that you talked about was when you mentioned for a top 10 prospect to um, succeed in the minor leagues, it's almost a guarantee, right? And that's what people are watching. They're watching their progression in the minor leagues. And, of course, a top 10 prospect is going to bat or pitch out of this world in single A or double A. Like, that's what they should be doing. So it's almost automatic that they're going to kind of add to the hype which would almost guarantee you to kind of grow that prospecting card before they become a pro, right? So I think, you know, if you talk to anybody who invested in, like, Joe Adele, Bowman first, and all that stuff, when they were, like, high prospects, I'm sure a lot of the guys made money before they sold, you know, they probably, hopefully they sold off before they became pros, and I'm sure they, they made some good profits. So, yeah, I'm going to say the, the lucrative side is, is the Bowman first. I'm not saying that I would do it, but um, I, I recognize that it's the more lucrative. I feel like it's the more lucrative of the two, two options. Good one. Yeah, I'll definitely agree that prospecting is more fun to do <laughs> because of the upside. <laughs> yeah. But um, but like you, I like the your Jared K- Kalanick example. Like that for me, I'm buying Jared Kalanick. I'm actually looking for right. one. Like someone mm. that has the hype prospect pedigree and doesn't perform well, but I still believe in him and his prices are as low as ever. That's a good time for me to buy. And you're not going to do that with every prospect. You're going to like some prospects are, you're like, you just watch them. You're like, oh, they can't play in the MLB. They can't play at this level. Right. And then you're off. Right. right. But, you know, there are guys like Kelnick who I just feel like he's too good. And, you know, the ultimate example is Mike Trout, right? His first half season up in the big leagues, batting 200, you know, I mean, right. and look at the player he is now. He just had to adjust. That's all he had to do. Right. Second huge example is Vladdy, right? Vladdy too, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Luis Robert. Luis Robert. Yeah. This yeah. year. This year is the year of Luis Robert. Year. <laughs> this year, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good one. Uh, we'll end off the show with my uh, pick one, and I promise this is my last Luka Doncic pick one. I just couldn't think of one <laughs> right on the spot before the show. But I chose this one because the prices are kind of ridiculous now. So my 1v1. On one side, you have your Luka Doncic Panini Prism Silver, PSA 10, which is now okay. at 2,700, 26, 2,700. Every time I say this, it goes down a bit, a bit lower. <laughs> uh, versus Luka Doncic's um, Optic Hollow PSA 10, which just sold for 2,700. So they're on par now. So wow, Optic Hollow and, Optic. and Silver Prism, yeah. So what are you guys, what are you guys doing? Because I'm maybe the reason why I'm bringing this up, like I'm really looking to buy a Luka Doncic right now, <laughs> but I'm like just waiting. I'm just waiting as it goes down. Um, but yeah. All right. What about you guys? Ah oh, man, this is tough. I love the optic of Luca. I I just love that card. I think it's a great card. But like I say, the Luca Silver Prism is the Grail card of his card. So I'm going Silver PSA 10. Okay. Um, for the same price. If optic was cheaper, I'd probably buy into the optic. But if they're at the same price, I think uh, the better buy is the Prism. Mm. Okay. And pop count is you know I'm just letting you guys know Silver Prism Somewhere? is about two thousand. Um, and Optic Hollow PSA 10 is about 200, 250. Oh, 200. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna pick Ho- Optic Hollow, mm. and it's a little bit personal bias. I, you know, we're, we're a bunch of old head collectors, and the rated rookie, man, like the, I right. love, I love the Optic product. And it's tough to say because I'm 100% in agreement. We, we even talked about it last week, and I was... You know, pumping, pumping up the Lucas Silver like it's it's gonna be an all time card. It's gonna be his like main iconic card. So it's hard to kind of come off of that. I it's it it's like oh, this is kind of a tough choice. 
But the Optic Hollow, I don't think will be that far behind in terms of one of the main cards to collect. It's kind of like like LeBron Tops Chrome versus Refractor versus the Bowman Chrome Refractor. I think the Bowman Chrome Refractor values are still pretty high, right? And I think the Optic Hollow, the print run is crazy low. I don't. I think may, may, maybe not a lot of people realize that. And also the gem rate is crazy low. So I think that low population is really going to uphold the values. I'm actually kind of surprised. I, it makes sense that they're the same price in a, in a sense, but I'm actually surprised. I, I would have imagined the hollow being more like $2,100 versus $27. Um, but That's I would pop if I, count protection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if, if Clark values you, I would try and be a little patient and see if I could make a move and make a steal on an optic hollow. I'm, I'm, I'm for the optic hollow. Okay. <laughs> well, I agree with all your points that you just mentioned, John, about the optic hollow. It's, it's, it's pure hobby logic again, like low pop right. count and the price it is now. But, you know, I've been in the hobby long enough where I, the market is the market. You know, the prism silver is the one that people want. Yeah. And I don't get it. Like, That's I, like nine thousand dollar card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, and it's yeah, I, I'm just not gonna fight it anymore. So I'm just doing, I'm just waiting for the silver prism <laughs> to maybe go sub twenty five hundred, and I might really be tempted at that point. But I'm still gonna go with silver prism, and uh, you know, there's you know because the demand is still there, it's gonna be fluid. I believe uh, when it does go up, I think there'll be uh, even um, uh, bigger demand once Lucas starts actually playing consistently well um so i love the optic hollow too like the card i saw the visual of optic hollow i prefer more than the silver right. prism in my opinion mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um if i'm doing it as an investor which i'm this is the scenario that i'm putting out i'm, I'm gonna buy the silver prism all right makes sense good ones today um and uh great episode i thought uh, especially with the interview with scott and um yeah thanks again for all our subscribers followers listeners to our podcast uh, we're really hoping that we get more interviews over the course of this year and and just really bringing um a lot of cool people in the hobby on just to talk about the hobby you know and just go really in depth uh, nerd out whenever possible so thanks again guys uh, if you haven't subscribed already you can uh, do so wherever you listen to your podcast on apple Podcasts or spotify thanks again we'll see you guys next week Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at 5 Card Guys, or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards, or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at 5CardGuys.com. Thanks again, and hope to connect soon.